stubborn ways. This is the word of God. We continue with the story of God this morning. A few good peeps, a few good men, a few good women. First of all, I want you to say with me, God is love. God is love. God wins. God wins. Love wins. Love wins. This really is the story of the book of Judges. It is God wins. That God has a plan for his creation and that he will in us affect one way or another to get us where we need to be. And he does this with love, with graciousness. You know the end of the story already. You know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. And the rest of the story, the end of the story is that love wins. God wins. Regardless of what the time may look like. Regardless of what everybody else may be saying. Regardless of what seems to be on the nightly news. Remember that in the end, God wins. We know this. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is our foretaste of that victory. Now, in the people of Israel, back during this time, of the judges, it was probably the lowest time in all the history of Israel. They were absolutely pathetic scoundrels. This was their worst, worst point in history. The book Judges is sort of a misnomer because we think of judges, you know, with a gavel and a black robe and ones that pass judgment. The Hebrew word shoftin can be rendered as judges and it was done so back when judges in the English language meant something other than it does today. One of the things we have to remember is that words in every language morph and they move, and they're a part of a living tradition. So what it meant then and what it means today, much different. It actually is better rendered as deliverer. The book of the deliverers, or the book of the saviors. For the word can be rendered in all of those things. A judge was not one who made judgments, but rather one who was, for the most part, a military warrior. One who set things right when things were wrong. One who God had used. This morning, as we remember, Joshua has gone into the promised land. And the promised land, Canaan, Palestine, is now theirs. And the twelve tribes have divided the land up from Dan in the north all the way to the south. And each clan had its own, each tribe had its own little section, its own piece of land. And then Joshua dies. Under Joshua, they were faithful. Under Joshua, they made the conquest, they conquered the land, they did what they were supposed to do. For the most part, things were going good. Now God first had Moses, and then he had Joshua, and now he isn't going to take the mantle and pass it on to another leader. Rather, God will be their king, and God will raise up individuals, men and women, for particular issues and for particular instances. But each tribe will be an independent state, will be an independent territory, and they will do what they're supposed to do. That was what was planned. Instead, it says in Judges, there came a time when every man did what was right according to his own mind. Now that seems sort of democratic. That seems pretty good. You know, every man did what was right in his own mind. That seems fair enough. However, disastrous results. Because when we do what's right in our own mind, remember that in our own mind, we can justify anything. Everybody thinks they're right. <laughs> if you didn't think what you were doing and what you were believing and what you were about was right, you'd do something else. 
So when we are left to our own desires and devices to follow whatever we think is correct and right, we got all sorts of stuff going on. I'll tell you, Adolf Hitler didn't think he was wrong. He did what was right in his mind. Pol Pot didn't think he was wrong. Mussolini didn't think he was wrong. And the list goes on and on and on. When we do wrong, we don't think we're really doing wrong because we come up with all sorts of justifications, don't we? That doesn't apply to me, that applies to somebody else. And, you know, we do. So when we, and the Bible says, each was doing according to his own mind what was right, disaster is about to happen. And so we go from Joshua into this 300 year period of judges, this period of sin and chaos. And six times there is this remarkable sin cycle that we're told which happens. And um, Israel serves the Lord, follows the commandments, does the worship of God, treats their neighbor as themselves, but then they fall into sin and idolatry. Now, we would sort of look back at the ancients and we would think, ah, oh, those unsophisticated, pre-modern people, they're, 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 they're poor folks. We would fall into idolatry. You know, how could they fall into idolatry and worship stone figures? And we may be more idolatrous as a people than they ever thought of being. But since I want to keep my job for just a little bit longer, I'm not going to go into that. Israel is enslaved then. God lets them have the fruits of their labor. They decide to follow what they want to do in their hearts and not God's. And so God says, you will have the consequences. I will be your God, take care of you, protect you, as long as you're keeping the covenant. When you're not, then I'll step back. And since you want to be on your own, you're on your own. And so they're enslaved by Midianites and Canaanites and stalactites and stalagmites and all the mites. Israel then cries out to the Lord. Lord, forgive us. Save us. We need you. God raises up a judge. There are 12 judges lifted in the scripture, probably many more. Israel is delivered. Israel serves the Lord. Boom, back into sin and idolatry. Six times over this 300 year period, Israel goes from good to bad to worse to being saved, to good to bad to worse to being saved, to good to bad to worse to being saved. Wonder how many cycles we have gone through. The Bible talks about these people, these few good men and women. Deborah, for people who don't think that women should be in places of leadership in the, the church, they're going to have to take that up with God because God raises up whoever God chooses to raise up. It isn't up to you and me or the Pope or anybody else. God chooses who God wants. And God chose Deborah to save his nation that we might have a Messiah. But these 12 people, the two I really want to look at today are the two for me most famous, Gideon and Samson. Gideon and Samson. So we'll talk about Gideon and Samson. Two people that are diametrically on the opposite ends of character. One goes from weakness to strength, while the other goes from strength to weakness. One goes from, from status to nothingness. The other goes from nothingness to status. All of the judges are people that are like you and me. They have feet of clay. There's not a hero in the bunch. They all have human frailty and flaws. They're just like us. And the examples that are given are given in such a way that we see and we think that's a most unlikely candidate. We would never vote or choose that person. And yet God does. Because in their curriculum vitae, their resume, their, their, their experience, their uh, achievements, there is nothing except God. That's all they got on the resume, God. 
And that's all they need. God humbles the proud. He reaches out and deals with and gives life to a nation through people whom the nation might not even recognize. You've heard of Samson. You know the story of Samson. Here's a, here's a trick uh, question. I saw this in a movie with Tony Curtis years ago. He goes into a bar and he's sort of a swindler. And uh, he takes a Bible with him and he sits down and so someone would buy him a drink, he makes a bet with him. And the guy's sitting around the bar and he says, I bet you don't know who cut Samson's hair. And they said, oh yeah, well, he's, I'll bet you a drink, five dollars. You don't know who. Now, the guys at the bar would respond, probably just like us. Who was it that cut Samson's hair? Nope. It says in the scripture, and this is where he won his money, he opens up, it says, and Delilah called forth the barber to cut his hair. It was a barber that cut his hair. Delilah called him, but she didn't cut his hair. It was a barber. I really went in left field on that one. Let's come back to the sermon. Gideon! Gideon! Gideon's a farmer. Gideon is a farmer who is a scaredy cat. He is a person who is, is, is plagued by the Midianites, as all of Israel is, are. They will plant their crops, and as soon as it's harvest time, the Midianites come and raid them and take all of their crops. So what does he do? It says right in the opening, Gideon was in the wine press threshing his wheat. He was hiding. You don't thresh wheat inside. You do it out on a hilltop, so the wind takes the chaff away. But he didn't want the Midianites to know he had this, so he hid and he threshed his, his wheat. And so the Lord comes to Gideon and he says, Gideon, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the Midianites out of Israel's business. Okay, Through you, I will save the Midianites. And he, in all faithfulness, says, get out of here. You know, shut up. That ain't going to happen. Me, I, 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 who am I? I'm a... I'm a farmer, and I come from the smallest clan of Manasseh, and I'm the youngest and weakest of my clan. And in other words, I have absolutely no redeemable qualities. There's nothing about me that would make you want to choose me. This must be a trick. You don't want me, God. Now, this is Gideon I'm talking about, right? Or is it? Ooh, or is it? The person who says, God, you don't want me. I don't have anything to offer. I'm not this person or that person, and I don't have this skill or that skill, and Lord, I got things I got to do, responsibilities, and you don't want me. And God says, I'm going to do something God-sized with you. God says, I'm going to do it. You're not going to do it. I'm going to do it. But it's going to be through you, saving a whole nation. Where the Messiah will come from a nation and save the world. I want you to do this. I want you to raise an army and I want you to take on the Midianites. He says, uh, God, you know, I, I, I don't believe you. So I have this fleece, this, this thing made out of uh, uh, wool. And I'm going to lay it down on the ground. In the morning, if I get up and it's wet from dew, but the ground is all dry, then I'll know, Lord, that it's you and not some trick. So he gets up in the morning and says, he takes that fleece and he rings it and water just pours out of it. And the ground is all dry. And he says, I'm not convinced you. This time I'll put it out and if it's dry and the ground is all wet, then I'll know it's you, Lord. He gets up in the morning, bone dry is the fleece, but the ground is all wet. God says, you ready to go? He says, okay, tell me what to do. He says, go and raise an army. So this little farmer who's used to hiding, not getting in anybody's trouble, not getting in anybody's way, not making a scene, not raising his voice, just sort of being in the shadow of things, not wanting to get too involved, he goes. And he tells his brethren, we're going to get rid of these midnights. The Lord has sent me. Come on, let's go. So he raises an army of 32,000 
warriors. The only problem is the Midianites have about 135,000 warriors. So 135,000 to 32. But they're brave and they march. And God says, wait a minute, Gideon, hold on. Because I don't want you or the people to think that this is something you're doing. You know, you go down there and 32 against 135, that's pretty miraculous. It's what, 1 to 6 or something? But that's pretty, pretty good. But if you win, you might think it was you. And I don't want that. So, tell anybody in your army who is afraid they can go home. Okay, so he says, God says anybody here that's afraid can go home. <laughs> 22,000 leave. 22,000 leave. Leaving 10,000. God said, all right, they start marching. Gideon, 10,000 against 135,000. God says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want you in any form or fashion to think that this is something you can do. If it's something you can do, you wouldn't need me. And you wouldn't want me. Because when you think you can do it on your own, when you think you can run your life, be the captain of your ship, you don't need me. And I want you to understand that you need me. So I want you to take all these guys down to the river. And I want you to watch. And the ones that bend down on one knee to drink, you send them home. The ones that get down on all fours and lap the water up like a dog, you keep them. So he watches. 300 men get down and lap up like a dog. Everybody else goes home. Get the scene now. Here's Gideon, little old farm boy with 300. That's it. Against 135,000. God said, now you probably know I got something to do with this. Go. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take jars and torches and trumpets. No swords. <laughs> no hand grenades. No tanks. No planes. No spears. Nothing except a clay jar, a torch and a trunk. And send 300 of, or send out of the 300, 100 men this way, 100 men this way, 100 this way, so you almost encircle the camp. And it's at night time. And what I want you to do is, when I give you the signal, I want you to break the jars, I want you to raise the torches, and I want you to blow the trumpets. Gideon says, okay, Lord, but he's still a little nervous. Believe it or not, he and his captain sneak down into the Midianite encampment because they want to know what's going on. They want to hear. And they overhear one soldier, the Midianites, talking to another. And he says, I had this weird dream last night that a loaf of bread rolled down from the hill and smashed our tents. And the other one said, that can only mean one thing, that, that, that Gideon and his army is going to come and wipe us all out. Gideon goes back, reinforced with that dream message. And they line up, and they smash the clay jars, which sounds like armor. And they hold up the torches, and they blow the trumpets. And all the Midianites get up in such a row, see all of the torches and trumpets, because that is what you stand out first, your standard, thinking there must be millions of them if there's this many trumpet players. Okay? And they start fighting among themselves. They spoke different dialects. And the battle went on. But Gideon and his men never took part in the battle. The battle was between the Midianites and the Midianites. And they slew each other. And Gideon and his army of 300 are involved in what is impossible. And the Midianites are no more. And Israel returns to the Lord. Israel returns to the Lord. Samson, another judge that is raised up, takes on the Philistines. You know the story. 
He's a Nazarite, which means he doesn't cut his hair or beard. That's where his power is. His power is not magically in his hair. His power is in his vow. His power is in the vow that he has taken since he was born, since his mama wasn't supposed to be able to have any children. And she miraculously had Samson, and they made him a Nazarite. And he, 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 he was vowed to die. But because of his personal flaws, him uh, liking the ladies a little too much, and getting involved with a Philistine, and you know how the story goes. The barber cuts his hair, they're able to capture him, but in the last moment of his life, he calls out to his God. Blinded by the Philistines, his eyes poked out, he pushes the two columns, collapses the building upon them. And the people of Israel have freedom. The message of the book of the deliverers, of the judges, and there are many stories, many wonderful stories, that if you're a child of Sunday school, you probably have heard several of them. They are miraculous stories of God's intervention. But the biggest thing about these stories, and the biggest thing to understand about the book of Judges, is that when we are left on our own accord, when we choose to do things our way, when we flee from God and God's holy word, we will find disastrous ends. We will go into collapse. God loves us, but he loves us too much to make us automatons, to make us robots, to make us people who cannot think. Love is always a matter of the will. It's something that we choose. And if we didn't have the choice, we couldn't love. If I had the magical power to, you know, say, you will love me, boom, that wouldn't be love. God doesn't do that to us. He gives us the ability to choose, to risk, to trust, like he gave Israel. We're a little better off because we have the guidance and the promise of the Holy Spirit. We can continually turn to God and he will always be there. That is his promise. And that is something we're called to do. But apart from God, we're in trouble. The thing I like about the sin cycle is it tells us what our response always should be. What it always should be. And that is right here. Israel cries out to the Lord. I think that when enough people who really desire God cry out, really want God, really voice their need for God, then God is going to respond in a miraculous way. As long as we say, God, you can stay up wherever you're at, we're, we're doing fine, we'll let you know when we need you. Now, we may not say that with our tongue, but do we say it with our lives, with our actions? Do we only think about God for about 25 minutes while we're sitting in church throughout the week? Or are we giving our lives, are we being totally sold out to our Creator and saying, here I am, Lord, I want, I want to do your will, whatever it is, not my own. I want to seek you, not the things of my own desires. I want you, God. When enough people cry out and say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come quickly, then the promise is, he will come. He will be there. The story, our story, his story, continues. We are a part of that story even as he tells us about Gideon and Samson in Scripture, we have to ask ourselves, how are we Gideon? How are we Samson? How are we Israel? How are we living our lives? May the Holy Spirit direct us and guide us as we discern this. Amen.